So it's, um, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome Marcel. Marcel did his PhD from uh, the University of Cambridge, and um, he was a postdoc at the University of Berkeley. He's now uh, in Princeton, IAS. He's going to talk uh, to us about uh, CMB lensing and uh, correlations between CMB lensing and galaxy clustering. Okay, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really nice to visit here. Uh, lots of great people to, to talk to, so I'm looking forward. Um, I'll be here today and um, most of tomorrow, so um, if you want to chat, just, just let me know. Um, I, I will talk about um, two projects um, that, that I've done recently. One is on the prospects for CMU lensing galaxy uh, clustering cross correlations, which will cover about the first half of the talk, and then the second half will be on initial condition reconstruction, which is related to um, what Willy's group is, is he doing here. Um, and this is together with uh, Tobias Baldov, Ur Seljak, and Matthias Seldriaga. Okay, let me uh, get started with the first part on CMB lensing. As you all know, the oldest light that we can observe is this uh, cosmic microwave background at redshift 1100. Um, the photons that come from that, um, that earliest light don't travel to us in straight lines, but they are slightly deflected by the dark matter distribution at, at late times. And, and this is what we call CMB lensing. Now, if you ask uh, what effect this has on, on the CMB temperature fluctuations, um, you can take a look at a 10 by 10 degree patch. And uh, this slide is stolen uh, from, from Blake Sherwin, where, where here he shows um, just what the unlensed CMB would, would look like, right? And then if you, if you add the lensing, you get a slightly different uh, picture, where um, it's maybe not so easy to see on the projector, but what you see is that there are these degree scale um, patches that are moving a little bit to the, to, um, to the side or, or up or down. Right. Now you can um, you can look at this in, in the whole sky, so not just on a 10 by 10 degree patch, but but on a much bigger map. Right. So now in each of these um, little maps, you, you you can you can see the lensing where where the um, the fluctuations on one degree scales uh, wobble around. Right. If you just look at a at a global statistic of that um, big um, of that full sky CMB map then you, you measure that global power spectrum, which shows that you have most power on this one degree scale. Um, and then you have like these acoustic um, oscillations um, at, at the smaller angular scales. Now, what you can do is you can say, let's go back to those 10 by 10 degree patches, right? And ask what, le what does the power spectrum look, look like in each of these small patches? If there's no lensing, then the, the local power spectrum is the same in each patch, right? So you would observe this um, acoustic peak at one degree scale at the same one degree scale in each patch of the sky. And that's, that's just because um, we, we have isotropy and homogeneity in, in the early universe. Now, if you turn on lensing, this, this will change, right? Because um, what lensing, so you could imagine having some, some lens in, in front of that patch, right? And then that could magnify or demagnify all the structure you see in here. So all the scales could get stretched or, or squashed, depending on if you have a void or a lens in, in front of that patch. Right, so um, an example is shown here, right? So um, in some patches, the, the, the power spectrum shifts to the right, so all the scales become smaller, um, whereas here, um, the, the power shifts to the left um, and everything is stretched, right? Now you can again ask what happens if I measure the power spectrum on, on the entire sky, right? And, and this is what you get. Basically, if you, if you measure, um, so right, if, if you measure the power spectrum in each patch and it's slightly shifted to the left or right, um, it turns out that you don't, so, and you, you average over all these patches, it turns out that you don't change the, the average peak, right? Once you average, you still get the same peak, and that's because the, the mean of the lenses is zero. But what you will get is you will get some, uh, some broader distribution around the, the truth, right? Because in some patches, you're, you're further to the left, and some patches, you're further to the right. So that leads to this peak smearing that you see here. So the, the acoustic peaks that you see in the unlensed CMB get, get smeared out and, and washed out because in different patches of the sky, scales are stretched or, or, or squashed. Um, this effect has been detected by, by Planck um, at about 10 sigma or so. Alex probably knows the number much better, um, right? But you, you, can do, you can do better, so you can, right, in, in, at the moment, so, so what I'm showing here is the effect you get when you average over all the patches. If you're after this lensing as an effect, you could ask, um, let's look for this modulation in different patches as a signal. Right, so you would ask, um, you know, how is this modulation of, of the local power spectrum? Um, you know, you can try, you can try to reconstruct that. 
Um, and that's what people do um, in, in this quadratic estimator uh, reconstruction. And um, the, the first um, detection of that effect where, where they did that, where they, basically, so where they, um, where they looked for this modulation and, and, um, uh, and checked for the effect of signal lensing is here in this paper by, by Kendrick Smith uh, from 2007 where he cross-correlates WMAP CMB lensing with uh, radio galaxies from NVSS. And this is like a, a few sigma um, detection here in, in cross-correlation. Today, this is, um, this is of course, um, much, we have much better data, so these um, signals have become much better. Um, so this is just um, some, some figures from, from the Planck papers where they um, take Planck CMB lensing reconstruction and cross-correlate with different galaxies, and um, they, they get something like 20 sigma. Uh, on some of these cross correlations. Um, th this is just an example there. There are many more um, um, analyses, right? So for example, Alex has done uh, cross correlations of CIB with ACT CMB lensing. Um, and then there are basically, there are lots of combinations you can do, right? You can also take SPT and you, you can correlate with, um, not just with galaxy clustering, but also with um, galaxy lensing, for example. Um, and this is becoming more and more, um, well, there are more and more cross correlations that, that people are measuring. Now, what I'm going to talk about here is um, kind of um, the, the prospects in the future, right? What, what we can hope for in uh, maybe five or ten years from now, right? And the idea is that um, if you look at the, the redshifts that CMB lensing is, is sensitive to, it turns out that you're mostly sensitive to this um, redshift around two, um, which is about half the, the distance to the CMB in, in physical units. Right, and most of these galaxy surveys observe kind of um, most of today's galaxy surveys observe the, kind of a low redshift regime, but in the future um, these surveys become um, more and more sensitive. They can go deeper, so we can we can actually fill up that that gap here at higher redshift and um, basically see the same structures as the ones that, that lead to the lensing of, of the CMB. So we expect that there will be a large cross correlation signal in, in the future. Right, we already see them, and they, they will become much better. Um, so what can we learn from this? Um, th there are a number of things we can do. Um, one thing that we can learn is um, the matter amplitude, sigma 8, as a function of redshift. Um, right by doing these cross correlations, we can basically cross correlate the CMB lensing with galaxies at different redshift, right? So we will know what the, the amplitude of um, fluctuations is at, at different redshifts, and I, I'll explain that more later. Um, we can also, uh, from that, we can, we, can, we can measure the expansion history, which is sensitive to dark energy. Uh, we might be able to see neutrino masses. And um, one application that I'm going to focus on um, mostly here is that we might be able to see primordial non-Gaussianity from, from inflation. You can also use these cross correlations to, to constrain galaxy bias and maybe learn something about galaxy formation. And there might be many more applications. OK, so um, what are the possible cross correlations we can do in the future? Well, on the CMB side, we have um, advanced actin SPT, which are already um, taking data. There will be Simons Observatory very soon, and hopefully there will be CMB S4 um, in the future. On the galaxy side, there are many surveys. This is already taking data. This should take data in a year or so, and this here is in the next couple of years. Um, right, so the, um, the specific combination that I'm going to focus on here is um, what can we learn if we have um, CMB S4 CMB lensing measurements, and we cross-correlate them with galaxies from, from LSST. Um, right, and the, uh, the, the driving question here is um, basically, if we assume that, that all our models are correct and that the service can deliver and we can mitigate all systematics, how well can we hope to do, right? So this is a very optimistic point of view, but I'm saying, like, let's say everything works. How much information is there? What kind of, uh, what is kind of the, kind of the best, the, the most optimistic scenario we, we could possibly hope for, right? This doesn't mean that these things, the systematics and so on, aren't important. It's just, you know, trying to make a first step and trying to see what, what we could possibly hope for to give us motivation to, like, you know, kill these systematics and work on them. Um, right, so this is, um, so, so what I'll talk about now are, are forecasts that we do for the CMBS4 across LSST. Right, and I'll, I'll talk about the ingredients that we use for these forecasts. Um, so first, we need some some number density for for the LSST galaxies, um, and you can and this is shown here in orange. It, it peaks at around um, uh, 50 galaxies per square arc minute. Um, that's right. And if you, if you integrate the, the entire red, um, the entire redshift distribution, you get something like 66 galaxies per square arc minute, which is uh, kind of optimistic. So um, Usually for LSST forecasts, especially after three years, um, they would say that you can maybe get 30 galaxies per square arc minute, so we are a factor of two optimistic. 
but one reason why you might hope that this is maybe okay is that we are, we are cross-correlating with the steam valenzin kernel, which is shown in black, which is very flat. Right, so we, we don't need this high precision um, redshifts that, that some of the other LSST applications need, especially shear. Right, so we might be able to get, a, to get away with um, somewhat worse um, quality um, photometric redshifts. Right, and that's um, why, why we hope that that factor of two higher number density might be possible. Even if, if that's not possible, um, after 10 years of LSST data, we, we should be able to get such a curve. Right? Um, just have to wait longer. Um, Maybe I'm jumping ahead, but in the cross-correlation forecasts, are you mostly limited by the reconstruction noise on kappa or by the shock noise on kappa? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's both. So I think if we, if we improve one of the two, we don't improve that much. But if we improve, if we improve on both, we, we get better. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, one, one thing that's also very important is um, a lot of the LSST surveys only consider low redshifts, or I mean, not, not all of them, but like a lot of analysis, a lot of the forecasts kind of um, focus on that low redshift regime, um, which is fine for, for, most of the, um, for most of the applications of LSST. But here we, we are interested in this cross correlation with CMB lensing, which is going to very high redshift. So we really want these galaxies out at high redshift, right? So that's why we add in this um, sample of dropout galaxies. Um, where the idea is that um, that imaging surveys see um, galaxies in certain bands, but they disappear in other bands um, because of the, the Lyman alpha break in, in the galaxy spectra, right? And, and so, so you, you might hope to you well, it's been shown that you can use that to, to detect um, galaxies at redshift um, four to seven. So HSC had this recent gold rush program where they found. Um, um, they found half a million of these dropout galaxies at redshift four to seven on just a hundred square degree. Right, so if you scale it up to um, half the sky that we might be able to see with LSST, you, you, you get something on the order of 50 to 100 million galaxies at that uh, very high redshift. Right, and that, that's uh, kind of what, what we put in here. So here we put in 50 million galaxies at, at redshift four to seven. Um, okay, so if we, if we make this assumption about the LSST number density, then that's the, the cross correlation coefficient that we get between galaxy clustering and, and CMBS4, CMB lensing maps. So um, the different curves here show different redshift bins of LSST. So for the lowest LSST redshift bin, you peak at like 70% correlation with CMB lensing on large scales. The, the, other, um, the other LSST redshift bins um, have correlation uh, on, on smaller scales. If you what you can do is now you can combine all these galaxies and you weight them in such a way that you trace the, the CMB lensing uh, kernel. And what you end up with is this combined uh, cross-correlation coefficient where you have like some, some com combination of all the galaxies that LSST sees weighted in some retrospective way. And the cross-correlation with CMB lensing is something like 95% um, at L of around 10. Now, why am I uh, talking about this cross-correlation coefficient? It turns out that that's um, very useful to, um, to play a trick that um, Ursh Selchuk uh, came up with um, in 2009. Um, and the, the idea is as follows. So um, just look at the, the upper panel for now. Um, let's imagine we, we observe CMB lensing and um, the power spectrum of our, um, observed, um, of our observation is, is this black curve here. So I'm dividing by the fiducial uh, power spectrum, right? So it fluctuates around one. Now let's assume that we observe galaxies that are 100% correlated with the CMB lensing, right? Then what you see is um, you, you, tra you trace exactly the same fluctuations, right? So the galaxies are just a factor two to, um, of the CMB lensing, right? What that means is that if you take the ratio of these two curves, you will find that the ratio is two, and you can determine that factor of two without any error bar, right? Because at every at every point you can just take the ratio and it'll always be two, right? And there will be no cosmic variance because the the up or down fluctuation, you, know, you don't care about for, for, the, for the ratio um, right, when you look at that. Now that's cool. Um, it's, specific, it's, it's particularly cool because you can, um, you can see certain signals with that, right? So um, if you look at primordial non gaussianity um, that has an effect on the biasing of galaxies, but it doesn't touch the, the, the gravitational lensing of the CMB. So if primordial non gaussianity is turned on, then the CMB lensing stays the same, but the galaxies get the scale dependent bias on large scales. Right, so if you now take, again, this ratio of the blue over the black curve, you will see that it's two here, but then it's, it becomes like one over k squared, or one over l squared on large scales. Right? And to the extent that these two maps are perfectly correlated, you can determine that, that number, the, the coefficient of the one over k squared with infinite precision, with no error bar. 
Now, in, in practice, that's not possible, right? Because you don't have two maps that are 100% correlated, and you, you will never have, right? But that's why I showed that plot here, right? Well, um, we don't get to 100%, but we get to 95%, right? So we, we, get, um, we get in a regime where the sample variance cancellation becomes interesting. And what you can work out is you can ask, like, what's the signal to noise for F and L for this primordial non gaussianity um, as a function of the cross correlation coefficient, and it scales like 1 over 1 minus r squared, right? So if, if, if the correlation coefficient goes to 1, then you divide by zero and the signal to noise blows up. Right? Um, and for its 95% correlation that we saw, you get like a factor of a few um, improvement from, from that simple um, scaling, from that simple relation. Okay, um, right, the, uh, this I, I think I said about the, the dropout galaxies. Um, right, so let's, um, okay, let's go further into the details of, of the forecast. Um, these are kind of the power spectra that we would expect from, um, from from LSST and CMBS4. So these are galaxy auto power spectra up here. The noise levels are shown in dashed. So you see um, it's signal dominated up to L of 1,000. Um, so some even higher. CMB lensing from CMBS4, a signal dominated up to 1,000 or so. Right, so you have um, that whole regime here where you have a lot of modes um, and, and you measure uh, galaxy clustering and lensing um, in a signal dominated regime. And then also the, the cross correlations have very high um, signal to noise. So the shaded areas show, show the expected error bars. Now, if you sum up the, the total signal to noise of these um, curves, you find that for, for CMB lensing auto spectra, you get something like 400 to 500 sigma um, for the total um, detection significance. For LSST auto spectra, you get 500 sigma up to L of 1,000, and something like 1,000 sigma if you go to L of 2,000. So these are huge um, signals, right? So each individual redshift bin ha has that significance. And then uh, the reason is just that they have like this insanely high number density, right? Um, so the shot mass is very low. Um, cross correlations are also um, at the few hundred sigma level. Okay, so um, then we do um, a Fisher forecast for um, for what um, what what kind of um, primordial long sanity we could expect from um, from this power spectra, right? And the ingredients are basically um, we use all the power spectra you could form from LSST clustering and, and CMB lensing, right? And, and this is the result. So uh, what I'm showing here is the expected F and L uh, one sigma error bar as a function of this uh, largest scale that's included in the analysis. So this is, um, in that regime, it's, it's very aggressive, right? This, this basically assumes that we can observe the whole sky. Um, something like L min of 20 is maybe more realistic if you, if you cut out um, the galaxy and so on. Right, so um, currently by Planck, um, that gray region is excluded. So um, Planck has constraints that F and L um, must be smaller than five. Um, uh, then at F and L of 1 is this transition between multi field inflation and single field inflation. And the forecasts that we get are um, somewhere in that range from F and L of 2 down to, well, if you had full sky down to F and L of 0.4 or something. Um, the difference between the, the dashed and the solid curves is if we um, include the sample variance cancellation or we don't include it. So you see there's um, something like a factor of 2 improvement um, for, from the sample variance cancellation trick. Now, yeah, okay. So, so that seems very promising, right? We can improve over Planck. Um, you can ask what's uh, driving these constraints. Um, we find that um, without CMB lensing, we would degrade um, by a factor 10 to 20. So, um, so that means it's really the cross correlation that helps us a lot here. The, the reason for that is partially uh, the way how we do the forecast. So we are, we are kind of conservative um, on the shape of the matter power spectrum. We, are, we allow that to, to change in the same way as, as F and L changes the galaxy bias. And we are marginalizing over that. So we are, we are basically making the forecast in such a way that we can only see F and L through cross correlations. So that's maybe a bit um, overstating how, how much CMB lensing helps. Um, still within the forecast we do, that, that, that's the factor we find. Then the, um, the sample variance cancellation helps by a factor of 1.5 to 2. Um, so it's important to observe things on the same sky, and on the same patch of the sky. Um, without the low L galaxies, we degrade by a factor 2 to 3, right? So um, that's basically in the, in the auto spectra. In the galaxy auto spectra, you get two bias factors. So you get B squared, and that's why um, you're very sensitive to F and L if you have large scale uh, galaxy power spectra. Without the the high redshift dropout galaxies that I mentioned, we degrade by a factor of two. And that's because if we don't have high redshift galaxies, we, um, we have a lower cross correlation coefficient with, with CMB lensing. Okay, what are some of the challenges? Um, well, maybe the most important challenge is that we need to go to large scales, right? So um, if you talk to, to people who actually do the data analysis, then 
um, it, it sounds very hard to, to, to go to um, L less than 20. Well, uh, a simple reason for a galaxy service is just if, um, if you have stars uh, that look like galaxies, um, you know, you confuse the two and then you, um, you screw up your signal and that happens in, in the galactic plane, which is on, on very large scales. Um, you could hope to get rid of that by projecting out modes that are aligned with the galaxy, but um, it's, it's not clear how well that would work. Another potential issue are catastrophic redshift errors, where um, what a particular problem that can happen is that um, you might think that a galaxy is at high redshift and has a scale-dependent bias on large scales, but actually what happens is that, that uh, that's a low redshift uh, galaxy that has high power and um, you confuse it with uh, something that's at high redshift. So that can kind of mimic an FNL signal um, through these catastrophic redshift errors. Um, what we find is that if we know the global number density of, um, of LSST, then we can, um, we, can calibrate, well, yeah, we can calibrate out that um, catastrophic redshift error, but that assumes a specific uh, parameterization of how these um, catastrophic um, redshift errors happen. Um, okay, so there, there are a lot of challenges. Yeah. So how low in L have people gone before on these galaxy surveys? That's a good question. People have done this FNL analyses yeah. for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, so I know on the CMU Linux side, no one has ever gone below L100, but everyone says it should actually be no problem. Well, no one's ever done it. Planck has 40, no? Yeah, but that's kind of their. They you could know. have worked a little harder to go lower than that if there had been a good science payoff, which this is. Right. They didn't go after the signal, so no one ever really tried, yeah. tried to do it. In yeah. principle, I think there's no real. There's no obvious reason why that shouldn't work on the CMP side. Mm -hmm. But on the Galaxy side, I, I don't know. Yeah. I also don't know. I, I, yeah, I think it's probably best maybe to look at Boris Leistat's paper, um, where they probably went to pretty low L. I, I would have to guess. I, I don't know. Um, but I guess they would do L of 30 or 40, right? But yeah. I, 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 I really don't know. Yeah, you need a lot of sky to even see anything, right? And they, they, get, they don't get too bad constraints, right? They get like FNL of 20 or 30. Yeah. So to get that, I, I'd imagine you need kind of lowish L, right? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know the numbers, so I, I need to check. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay, so um, that was about FNL. Now, a, a second application that, that you can um, you, you can hope for with these um, cross correlations between CMB lensing and galaxy clustering is that you might be able to constrain the matter amplitude sigma eight as a function of redshift, right? And the, the idea is that if you, if you only observe galaxy auto power spectra, they are sensitive to, to the galaxy bias and to the sigma eight, which is the amplitude of the matter fluctuations. But you have a per, if you only measure galaxy auto spectra, you have a perfect degeneracy between linear bias and, and sigma eight. Now, if you include cross correlations with lensing, you have one, fewer, uh, one less factor of, of B1, right? So you can break the degeneracy between B1 and sigma eight. If you also include the kappa auto power spectrum, um, you can do this even better. Right, so that's the idea. And indeed it works very well in, in, in these forecasts, right? So we find that um, if you just assume linear bias, then you can, you can measure sigma eight at sub percent precision um, if you go to small enough scales. So at, um, yeah, at L max of, of a thousand or so, you get, um, I don't know, point, point three percent um, measurement of sigma eight in broad redshift spins, right? So you could measure sigma eight at redshift point, uh, redshift zero to 0 0.5 with that sub percent precision at redshift 0 0.5 to one with that precision and so on. Now, if you have these different sigma eight measurements in different redshifts, um, you can use that to constrain um, dark energy, right? Which, which kicks in at late redshift and, and changes the expansion. Or you might also um, hope to, to constrain neutrino mass from that. And, and that's something that, that we've been looking in more recently. So Bianchi, you, uh, you at, at Berkeley is a graduate student who, who is um, driving this further um, together with a few others. Okay, um, at the same time, when we measure sigma eight, that means we can also uh, measure B1, right? Because we, we break that degeneracy between B1 and sigma eight. And the uh, constraining power is pretty similar, right? So we can, um, it looks like these biases of broad LSST uh, redshift bins can be measured um, again to like point few percent uh, level precision if, if you go to small enough scales. Now the, the big caveat here is that on small scales, nonlinear biasing is an issue, right? So we, um, our, our forecasts are optimistic in, in that regime, right? Right, so um, uh, yeah, so, so that's something you might worry about, right? But at the same time, we could hope that we can maybe model um, bias better. We might 
ho we might hope that we can model nonlinear bias better in the future, right? This is all stuff in five or ten years, right? So um, hopefully there will be some progress on understanding bias parameters um, that we can maybe put in some priors what nonlinear bias will look like, and then we could hope that we could uh, still get linear bias in sigma eight at, at that level of precision, maybe. Um, okay, but that, that's the main um, complication, right? So um, in the in the second part of the talk, um, I, I will talk about um, hopes um, how we can um, get around these nonlinearities on small scales, like nonlinear biasing. Okay, so let me conclude with this first part of the talk. Um, I showed that uh, CMBS4 lensing uh, cross correlated with LSST clustering is, is very promising, especially for measuring per model longer sanity and uh, matter amplitude as a fun function of redshift. Uh, the joint analysis is crucial, so we get a factor of 10 improvement if we include CMB lensing compared to having no CMB lensing. And um, yeah, the, the challenge is, um, I guess I mentioned, right? So you want, you want large scales for FNL and you want um, uh, better models on small scales for, for sigma eight. Okay, so let me um, come to the second part of the talk unless there are questions. Um, okay, so, um, right, so in the second part I will um, talk about a slightly different topic which is um, about how we can try to reconstruct linear initial conditions from observed um, nonlinear galaxy clustering, right? And one motivation, um, as I already mentioned, is that on small scales, there's nonlinear structure formation happening, so we cannot easily relate a cosmological model to, to the nonlinear observations that we have. By reconstructing the initial conditions, we can try to, to get around that problem. Um, but you can have an easier, even easier motivation, which kind of relates a little bit to that seam balancing story I told earlier. Right, so um, remember in, in the CMB we have these acoustic peaks which um, have like some um, separation of, of one degree or so. It turns out that in the galaxies you also have a preferred separation um, which is at around 150 megaparsec. And uh, this is referred to as baryonic acoustic oscillations. Right, and what you can do is if you, if you observe that preferred um, physical separation at different redshifts, then you can, right, for, for each redshift, you can basically um, ask what's the angle, um, the angle extent of that physical size, right, and that tells you the, the distance, um, how far away um, that, that standard ruler is as a function of redshift. So that means you get a measurement of distance as a function of redshift, which again measures um, growth, right, so, or, or the expansion of, yeah, just the expansion of, of the universe as a function of, of redshift, right, so you can measure the Hubble parameter um, through these uh, standard ruler distance measurements. Uh, this has been shown in practice to work very well, so you can, you can see um, the baryonic acoustic peaks in, um, in, in, in Sloan data, for example, right? Um, but let me get back to, um, to why this is, um, why we need uh, reconstruction um, to, to, to do that better, right? So, so to motivate this further, let me, let me, let me explain more uh, why we see that preferred um, separation of 150 megaparsec in the galaxies. Um, Right, so at the very early universe, we have this hot sea of, um, of the coupled baryon photon fluid where um, uh, basically the photons are too hot. Um, so so the, the photons are, are very hot, so they, they, um, they throw um, electrons um, away from, from the uh, protons so hydrogen cannot form. Um, this goes on for, for some time until photons are, are cooled down and, and electrons can combine with, um, with the protons to form hydrogen. At that point, there, there's no coupled um, fluid anymore between baryons and, and photons, right? So the, the, the baryons will just stay in place because they don't feel the photon pressure anymore and the, the photons will, will move outwards in a free stream to, to become the CMB that we see today. Now, as I said, the, the baryons are kind of coupled to the photons here, but then at that point when the CMB, uh, at that point of decoupling, um, the baryons are not coupled anymore, so they will just uh, stay in place and, and cluster, right? So, um, but what that means is that the baryons moved from, from that um, big bang time to decoupling time Right, and then they stay in place, and the, the distance is exactly that 150 megaparsec that I mentioned, right? So the, the distance of the sound wave from Big Bang to, um, to the coupling is, um, is 150 megaparsec. So that's why we see that preferred clustering um, at separation of 150 megaparsec. Um, so a neat way to, to kind of explain the, well, right. So, okay, I guess that makes sense, right? So what I'm gonna talk about now is like what, uh, what happens by nonlinear structure formation, right? So imagine you're in the very early universe, um, you have some, some over density here in the middle, and then you have a lot of galaxies in this ring around the, uh, the, the central over density uh, that's separated by 150 megaparsec, right? So that's this preferred separation from, uh, from BAO. Now, um, one thing that happens by structure formation is there can be very large scale displacements that, that move the entire um, picture to the left or to the right. Now that won't change the BAO scale, right? The, the separation 
of the center to, to, the, to the ring will be exactly the same if I move the entire thing to, to the left or right. So these large scale displacements don't, don't do anything to BAO. However, there, there, there are also displacements on smaller scales, say around 100 megaparsec or between 10 and 100 megaparsec, and they are more dangerous, right? Because they can, in some places, they can move um, the ring inwards, and in other places, they can move the ring outwards, right? And so this is shown in, in that movie by Nikhil Padmanabhan here, um, where yeah, he's, he's just like forward evolving that, that, that um, configuration. And you see in some places, galaxies move away from the center, right? So here you will measure a larger BAO scale. And in other places, it moves towards the center. So here you will measure a smaller BAO scale, right? So now if, you, if you'd average around the ring and you, you were asking, you, you would ask what's the BAO scale, you would still roughly get an unbiased measurement, but you would have a bigger error bar in your BAO scale, right? Because you, you, it's like in CMB lensing, right? You, you, you're averaging over, several, over different patches. In each patch, you have a slightly different um, length scale, right? And so, so the averaging introduces some, some bigger error bar. And the, the increase of the error bar is basically given by the dispersion of that uh, fluctuation ar around the mean that, that happens from the fluctuations, right? Okay, now, um, so that's bad, right? Because that basically means that um, the, if, we, if we measure Hubble constant from BAO measurements, we get that degradation from these large scale displacements, right? Um, yeah, that's kind of, I don't know why. <laughs> Should ask Nikhil, yeah. Oops. Okay, so, um, so then a nice thing that you can do, and, and that's been um, worked out by Daniel Eisenstein um, in 2007, um, right, Th these movements here are kind of on large scales, right? So this is like 10 megaparsec or something. So you can probably guess where things came from, right? So that's what, what uh, Daniel proposes, right? He's saying like, okay, let's estimate the potential of that distribution of galaxies and then just move galaxies um, back along the potential. Right? And if you do that, as that's shown in that movie here, the galaxies move back to that um, BAO ring and you increase your, um, your BAO signals noise. So you, you, you undo that, that peak smearing that, that happened from the, um, from the large scale motions. Now this is very nice and it's been applied to, to real data and works very well. So um, by doing this reconstruction on, um, on BOSS data, um, they found improvements of, um, of distance measurements by a factor 1.5 to 2, right? So it works uh, very nicely on, on real data. Okay so, um, okay, so that was, I guess, uh, motivation why we want to do um, reconstruction if we're interested in BAO. But that might not be the only thing you're interested in, right? Maybe a more generic uh, motivation to, to do this reconstruction is that you, you would also want to, um, to constrain cosmology from the small scale, um, from a small scale power of the galaxy density. Right, and in that regime, the, the problem is um, that you cannot model uh, the power spectrum. You have covariances between um, different bins of the power spectrum. So although you get more modes, these modes are correlated. So your, your improvements of cosmological parameters don't scale number of, like number of modes. So this um, nonlinear regime is kind of like something we've been hoping for for a long time, but then it, um, it's very difficult to enter, right? Because we can't model things, there are covariances, and um, there's maybe not as much information as we were hoping for. By doing reconstruction, the, the hope would be that we can, we can basically move this nonlinear stuff back to, to a more linear regime and then extract the full uh, linear information from, from that regime. Okay, so what are some of the ways um, to, to get at that nonlinear information? I guess I, I kind of um, mentioned one already, right? You, we, we, can, we can improve analytical models to try and uh, model the nonlinear regime better, and, and Simon has been uh, doing some great work on this um, in, in Stanford. Um, where they use effective field theory for that, right? But um, the problem is, um, I mean, you improve somewhat, right? But um, at some point, um, you're always too nonlinear um, for analytical models to, to work very well. So another approach might be that you could simulate everything and then um, infer cosmology from that. Um, that also comes um, with its own disadvantages, I guess. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, so um, the, the, the ones potential solution that I'm, or the, the one approach that I, I'll talk about here is um, that we could hope to transform the data to, trans, to, to reduce nonlinear dynamics, right? And this is kind of the, the idea of reconstruction, right? We are moving galaxies around, which is a transformation of the data, and then that gives us a more linear field, so we can, um, for, by measuring the power spectrum of that, we can get more, more information. 
Okay, um, a final thing that uh, you might want to do is you could exploit non-Gaussian tails of the probability distribution of the galaxies. Um, and that's, um, again, that, that, that works in the mild nonlinear regime, but once you, once you become too nonlinear, um, th th this becomes very complicated and it's, it's difficult to get a lot of information out of that. But in principle, all these approaches are, are valid approaches, right? Um, so I'll just um, talk about this here um, for the sake of the talk, but, but the others are, are very um, interesting approaches too. Okay, so um, let me get um, back to like, uh, what, what we're trying to do. Right, so we have um, the initial conditions in the early universe, say like a redshift 100 or so, then there is a nonlinear dynamics that moves, to, um, um, that moves these initial conditions to the observed galaxy distribution. And with reconstruction, we're trying to get back um, to, to the initial conditions. Now there are several paradigms how one might want to do that. The first paradigm is what I already mentioned uh, by Daniel Eisenstein and others. Um, where the idea is basically you estimate velocities or potentials and you move uh, galaxies backwards, right? So that's kind of backward reconstruction. A second paradigm is, um, um, that's been proposed by Jens Jasche, uh, Ben Wandelt and, and others is that you, you sample uh, the, the Gaussian uh, initial conditions as a random field. You run a simulation to forward model this. You compare that with the real observations and then you kind of go back uh, and keep it if, if it looked good uh, or resample if it didn't look good. Right, so you're kind of like in this, in this forward modeling um, loop where you, 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 continue, you, you improve your initial conditions such that um, you, you get something that agrees with the observed galaxy distribution if you, if you forward simulate it. And that um, seems promising but of course it's computationally very expensive because the, the number of parameters is given by the number of phases or the number of modes in, in the initial conditions. But so, they, so they need to play some tricks to, to be able to do that. And one specific um, thing that they have to do is they, they have to assume some simplified nonlinear dynamics usually. Right? So they, they're, they're trying to improve this to make the nonlinear dynamics better and better. But currently that's kind of the, the limitation of, of this approach is that um, and the nonlinear dynamics is, is, not, is not perfect, right? And, and then you don't know what, if what you get is correct or not. What are they actually using? Um, 2 LPT, I think. 2 LPT. I, I think they're working on, um, on PM methods, so um, the, the, then that should be better. But still, I mean, you don't have an in-body simulation, right? So, and I, I guess, yeah, right. Anyhow, I mean, it, it, might, it might all be solvable, right? It's just um, at the moment, I, th I guess it's computationally very expensive, and, um, but uh, yeah, it looks nice. Uh, and third, um, what you can do is you can do something similar to, to the sampling forward modeling, um, but instead of sampling, you optimize, right? So you write down some likelihood for, um, for this observed uh, galaxy distribution given the initial conditions, and then you kind of um, write down an optimizer to, to solve for, for the initial conditions. And that's been proposed by, by the Berkeley group around um, uh, Ursh Seljak and, and uh, Yu Feng and, and Sherrod Modi. And, and, uh, um, and they, they're working very actively on this, right? So, um, so that looks promising too. Okay, what I'll talk about is just this uh, first approach of backward reconstruction, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, as I mentioned, Daniel Eisenstein kind of um, was uh, first to, to introduce this, um, I guess, in, well, there were earlier papers, but this was like the, um, the first um, application to real data. Um, then there's a lot of work by, by Uli Penn here and um, also Matthias Salariaga and, and Svetlana Tassif have, have been working on this in the past. Okay, so um, to motivate the specific um, reconstruction algorithm that we are working with, um, let me explain what nonlinearities we are fighting, right? So um, let us look at this simple example where we have some uniform particle distribution in the initial conditions, and this is just in one dimension. Then f each particle gets moved to some final location by some displacement field, right? So then there, there are two nonlinearities that happen. The first one is that the displacement field from initial to final density is nonlinear in the initial conditions. So you have some, some linear part and then you have some, some nonlinear part, which is kind of the, the two LPT part of the displacement. Now it turns out that that's a very small nonlinearity, so we can model this perturbatively and that works uh, fairly well. Um, Now another nonlinearity that happens is that you can have this shell crossing here, right? So what, uh, what happens here is that you, you have these particle, um, particles here, but instead of moving to the kind of next position in, in, in the final space, it kind of like goes um, to the right and this goes to the left and the, the trajectories cross in the middle. Now this means that the, the final um, positions are very nonlinear related to, to the initial conditions, or it's even, it's, it's not injective, right? You, you cannot undo this. So if you observe, um, if you just observe the final positions, you cannot tell if the trajectories were like this or like this, right? Um. 
In particular, that's the case because you don't know velocities, right? But even if you knew velocities, you couldn't know how many times there was shell crossing. So it seems like you're really destroying um, information about the initial conditions because you have different initial con yeah, you have different um, yeah. you have different initial conditions that um, kind of map to the same final conditions. Okay, so um, what what does um, reconstruction do? In the standard approach, as I said, you just um, um, you, you estimate potentials and you move uh, things backward by, by one step. Um, now, an alternative um, way um, to, um, to do the reconstruction is to say, um, let's assume that there's no shell crossing, right? Because we, as I showed, we, or as I kind of suggested, is, uh, we, we cannot really tell um, what happens when, once the shell crossing occurred, right? We cannot tell how many times the shell crossing happens, this information is destroyed. So let's just assume we, we give up on trying to get any information from things that shell crossed and only get information where there's no shell crossing. In that limit, we can say, okay, what's the, um, yeah, we can just say the correct dynamics is the one where no cr um, shell crossing happens, and that should be as good as the one where shell crossing happens. Right? Now, if we do that, um, we, so if we, if we say, okay, we give up on shell crossing, then there's a unique mapping from this final to initial conditions, right? We basically just sort the particles such that they're, they're equidistant in, in initial conditions. And then, um, so, so what gi this gives us some displacement field, and we can estimate the linear density by taking the divergence of that displacement field. Um, right, so then there are two algorithms to do this. Uh, the first was uh, proposed by Uli Penn uh, and, and his group, um, also with a, with a lot of people here. Right, and here the, the idea was that um, you get this displacement from this um, distribution of late time galaxies um, back to the initial uniform um, distribution by, by putting some mesh uh, through these uh, galaxies. Um, right, and then you, you're, you're moving that mesh backwards to, to the initial conditions by continuously distorting uh, coordinates. Um, making sure that shell crossing never happens. And they, they use um, a moving mesh code um, um, to, to do that, right? And the, the, there, there are several papers on uh, applications of this. So this is the first algorithm. Um, the, the, the second algorithm, and that's the one that I'll be talking about um, next, is um, to do um, what we call iterative reconstruction, where the idea is exactly the same. We also try to get this displacement field from um, uniform initial conditions to the late time density. Um, but now the algorithm to get the displacement is different. So basically what we do is we say, um, first we want to have, um, first we move things in such a way that the nonlinear density is coherent with the initial density on large scales. So we basically do a Seldovich uh, displacement with a large smoothing scale. Then patches agree with each other in initial and final conditions on large scales, right? So once we have achieved that, we can kind of zoom in, decrease the smoothing scale and do um, so Dolch displacement within um, each of these smaller patches, right? So basically we do standard reconstruction, but iteratively with decreasing um, smoothing scale, right? And, and this is um, how it works in practice. Uh, so, uh, sorry, how, how am I doing on time? Um, ah, great, okay. Um, right, so what I'm showing here is um, on the left, I have um, initial conditions. Um, so this is just a Gaussian random field. On the right, I have um, the observed uh, density, where by observed I just mean nonlinear dark matter in, in this case. Um, so there are no galaxies uh, yet, right? And the goal is to go from, from right to left, right? So then um, if we apply this reconstruction that I just mentioned, in the first step we, we kind of um, make sure that the density is the same on, on very large scales, right? So we get this large scale blobs to agree with each other by doing a one step Seldovich displacement with like 10 megaparsec smoothing or something like that. And then we, we do the same, but on, with smaller and smaller smoothing scale. So we recover the, the smaller scale structures until after about eight steps, um, uh, the, there's not much change anymore, right? And as you can see, um, the, the, the kind of coarse grain structure is the same um, in this reconstructed um, density and in the initial conditions. But if you look at, at smaller detailed structures, uh, there are differences, right? So that, that's basically when shell crossing happens, we, we can't tell uh, what's correct, so we do a mistake there. But the hope is that you know, we, we are not more wrong than, than other methods. Um, okay, so um, you can look at this more quantitatively by looking at the, um, at the correlation coefficient of the, of the reconstructed density with, with initial conditions. Um, so let me, um, okay, so, so this plot is showing um, yeah, correlation coefficient of, of a density with initial conditions. Here's um, no correlation, here's 100% correlation. This is large scales, this is small scales. So you see the correlation between observed nonlinear density and initial conditions is 100% on large scales, but then it drops very rapidly on, on, on smaller scales, um, right? Because the, there's nonlinear structure formation, so you lose um, coherence with, with the initial conditions. 
Now, if you do standard reconstruction, you do better. So you're 100% correlated uh, out to smaller scales. But again, you drop on these um, kind of smaller scales. Then if you do this uh, new reconstruction that um, will Lee and, um, or, or our method, you, you get a much better correlation coefficient, right? So you get um, something like, I don't know, 90% up to K of point, or 95% up to K of 0.4 or something like that. So you get extremely good reconstruction of the initial conditions. Now there's a big caveat here, um, and that's um, the, the caveat here is that we didn't include any shot noise in, uh, in these simulations, right? So this is dark matter only, so we can perfectly, um, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we don't have any noise in the, in the dark matter snapshots. Um, and it turns out that's, that's a big caveat, right? So once you include noise, um, as this group has shown, right, then um, uh, you get a lot, um, you, you get a big uh, degradation. Um, but anyhow, if there's no noise, uh, we can perfectly reconstruct uh, initial conditions, basically, out of relatively small scales. How does your system Yeah, um, it's kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult to compare because we are not doing this, I mean, we are not, not the same redshift, not the same, um, yeah, so it's different, but I, I think in general they do slightly better. Um, but the improvement is not as big as you might hope, um, as they might hope, I guess. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's going back and forth. So um, I, I guess a big deal for this is, um, I mean, this is kind of academic because it's dark matter. But so I think the, the big question is really like what we can do for halos. And um, so they, they've been working on some, um, some neural network thing to, to get the halos correctly from the dark matter. And that seems to work really well. Um, but um, yeah, it depends on the neural network in the middle. So uh, you need to trust that maybe. So I don't know, it's, it's going back and forth, right? Um, the hope of this is that it's, it's simpler and much faster, and um, we hope that we can get, we, our hope is that we are almost as good as them, right? But we wouldn't expect to beat them, right? Because they, um, they, they run like full simulations and, and try to like optimize. So their approach should in principle be better. Our hope is that we can do, with a much simpler algorithm, we might be able to do as well. Um, Uh, yeah, I don't know, but so so just I mean to say here, I mean computational cost is it's as expensive as standard reconstruction, right? Because I mean, you're, I mean it's eight times more expensive than standard reconstruction because you do eight um, steps, right? But it's um, it's not you know that's that's not a big deal. It's, it's it's faster than estimating the power spectrum, right? Because I mean what well it depends on the number of galaxies, I guess. But it, I mean computational cost is not a problem. Actually, all this stuff I ran serially, so I didn't even bother to to, to parallelize it. But it takes like an hour or two to run on a single core, so so computational problem. Computationally, there's no problem. For Urish's stuff, um, I mean that they, they, so far they only use 128 cube um, reconstructions, right? Which tells you that it's computationally hard because, I mean, Yu Feng is like one of the most serious numerical guys, right? And if he's running on something on 128 cube, that really means something. But they, but, use, um, fast PM. they use fast PM for that, yeah. But still, it's it's like, yeah, I mean this. This optimization is, is very expensive, I guess. So they, um, yeah. But I mean, that's not necessarily a big problem, right? If, if, you, if your computers are big enough, that, that doesn't matter. Um, so, so um, can I understand a bit more about the uh, layer filtering? Thing? Yeah. Because it seems like you have a system that you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, so the top one is. Uh, it's like Gaussian 10 megaparsec um, smoothing. 10 megaparsec. Mm -hmm. Then um, the next one, do you do it differentially? Uh, I do five and then two. I, I, do, I divide by a factor of two in each step. But it's like uh, a but sequence of, uh, of wavelengths. Um, no, I just. I, I, oh no, I, I apply. Um, I apply Gaussian smoothing first with ten megaparsec, then with five, then with two point five, then with oh, one point two five. So, so it's not differential. No. It's actually a sequence. Yeah. Although. What happens is like, so let's say I only apply 10 megaparsec all the time and I don't decrease the smoothing scale. Then um, after the first step, not much would happen, right? Because basically, um, the, so once I have the first step with 10 megaparsec, things are moved. So there's no potential on large scales anymore. So then if I did the same thing, it, it, it wouldn't make any difference, right? So uh, are you um, computing, um, what do you do computing once you've got that? Oh. Yeah, that's right. So in the first, yeah, so, so we start with a catalog of particles. We compute the potential. We move the particles. Then we have a new catalog. Then we compute again the, 
the potential and then we move it again and yeah so we do this like iteratively and then in the end what we end up with is a, is a catalog where galaxies are basically uniform right and right but we remember like which galaxy came from where so we can measure like what's the displacement that each particle went and then we take divergence of that to, to get the linear density which is the same as what um, group here is doing. Um, yeah. we, you, you can also add a second order L, to LPT correction to that, which, which helps on large scales, but doesn't really do much on, on small scales. So that's the difference between the, um, the, the solid and the dashed, is if you convert the displacement field assuming 2LPT instead of Soldovich. So, so if you get like delta linear, it would be some combination of uh, psi and psi squared or something like that. So it would be a, a better way to get linear density from the displacement field. But it's a, it's a small correction on small scales. On large scales, it's a bigger correction. So you can kind of see that here. So what I'm, what I'm showing here is, um, is, a, is a different look at that plot, basically. So here I'm showing correlation coefficient. And this plot is showing 1 minus correlation coefficient squared, which is a measure of the, the error that you're making compared to, to the signal, or, or the power of, 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 of the error that you're making. And um, so, so here, um, the lower you are, the better, because that means a small error. Right, and so, so if you do this 2LPT um, conver conversion of the displacement field to linear density, we get this dashed curve. If we just do the Seldovich um, formula, we, we get that curve here. So on large scales, you get a big improvement. It's not clear how, how, how useful that is because there's, of course, a lot of cosmic variance there. Um, okay, so then um, one can do a lot of more things um, like the group here has done, right? So you can look at BAO. Um, so um, let me maybe just uh, talk through that plot real quick. So um, what you see on the left are 10 simulations. Um, and I'm showing in the initial conditions um, the BAO scale, right? So it, it, it scatters around, um, around the, the true BAO scale, right, um, because of cosmic variance. Now in the final conditions, if you measure BAO scale, it, 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 it is, um, um, it's moving around, right? It's all over the place. You don't see the initial BAO anymore. You see some, some other BAO scale. If you do standard reconstruction, you're moving the BAO scale back to where, where it was before, right? Um, but you still have a lot of um, dispersion between the points, right? So your BAO measurement is worse. Now if you do this new reconstruction, you, you, you perfectly get back the, the initial conditions on, on a um, realization by realization ba uh, basis, right? It, again, this is assuming no shot noise, right? If, if you include shot noise, this becomes worse. Um, okay. Right, but I mean, what, what this is kind of saying is that, you know, if there's no noise, we can get the linear BAO perfectly within um, a huge volume. So cosmic variance will always be, the cosmic variance error on BAO will be much bigger than the error that we get from this dispersion of, um, of that we get from the displacements in different patches, right, um, if we do reconstruction. Okay, then um, the final application is that you can look at the broadband power spectrum of the reconstructed density. Um, so if you don't do reconstruction, you get that um, solid curve. If you do reconstruction, you get these curves down here. So you see that you slightly improve um, the K range where you, where you match the linear power spectrum. But th there is a deviation um, um, going on. So, so the power spectrum is still different from linear, um, even on these scales of K of 0.2 or K of 0.3. So you don't get exactly the linear power spectrum if you do reconstruction, but you get something that, that looks fairly simple, right? So maybe a Soldovich power spectrum or um, so some simple model could, could Get that better. Sorry? Sorry? A T1 bar. A T1 bar. Oh, that's using a transfer function to, um, yeah, I think that's using a transfer function um, in, in the reconstruction. So this, this here is not using any transfer function. This is just using divergence of chi, and uh, divergence of the displacement. This here is, is using divergence of displacement times a transfer function. Um, so it has more free parameters. And you, yeah, you improve a little bit, but not, not too much. And then, yeah, this here has one or two transfer functions, I forget. Probably two. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it might be that, no, I think actually that that transfer function is to match against the linear density. So I guess we, we'd first compute divergence of chi, and then we, um, we look at the, the linear density and construct transfer function from that. But yeah, you could also do it at the displacement level. Yeah. yeah. Okay, challenges. Um, right, so first is of course that there's shot noise um, because we have a finite number of galaxies. That seems to be a, a big uh, deal breaker. So we, we've been uh, working on this a lot over the winter and we are still not sure um, um, what the answer will be. Um, th there's also um, halo galaxy biasing um, that, that, that will be present if, if we do this for halos and we're we working on this at the moment as well. 
And then um, in the future, um, what we are trying to look into is um, retro space distortions, um, survey mask, and um, what happens to primordial FNL if, if we do reconstruction. Um, the group here is a bit further ahead, so they, uh, I guess are maybe here. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so we are um, trying to catch up, I guess. Um, all right. Um, so let me conclude. Um, yeah, I, I guess I said all of these things, right? So nonlinear physics uh, limits uh, science return of galaxy surveys. Um, reconstruction can reduce that. Um, the, reconstruct the specific reconstruction algorithm that I presented achieves 95% correlation with the linear density at k of less than 0.35 at, at redshift zero if there's no shot noise. It improves the BAO signal to noise by a factor 2.7 to 2.5 over doing no reconstruction. And it improves the BAO uh, by 70 to 30% compared to standard reconstruction. Um, yeah, the hope is that once we apply this to, to real data, we could improve um, a lot of the uh, science that galaxy surveys are after. So um, yeah, we're trying to push this forward and ultimately go to, to real data, hopefully. And uh, let me stop here. Sorry for running a bit over time. Yes, you're, you're fine. Okay. So I, I, I had a question on the. So you use the potentials to uh, move back the points in the reconstruction. And you showed a couple of curves where you know, you're repeating the curve. So do you put additional constraints on, for example, you preserve the area under the curve when you do the reconstruction? Uh, we, we don't, but I think the, um, in, in the least method, uh, the, the kind of, I think they, I mean, there might be constraints, right? Yeah, the, the, my question is the, the reconstruction that you explained, you move the points back by computing potential. Um, are there any additional constraints that could include reconstruction? So there's few, the thing that try to keep the area under the curve. Uh, I guess the assumptions we have are similar. Right? So I guess for you, I mean, you might be like more concrete in making sure that shell crossing never happens, right? Um, whereas we kind of hope for it. Right. But then, is that guarantee a unique solution? I mean, the smoothing scale is definitely an issue, right? If you if you do diff yeah, if you choose the smoothing different at different iterations, you, you get different answers. But I guess the hope would be that you're fine as long as you get something that's very well correlated with initial conditions. Right? But yeah, there might be multiple solutions, I guess. And also, the other way to, uh, to see this is that you're trying to recover this, uh, the fact that you use uh, with another like, the displacement, the dental displacement theory, right? But you always have some relative density. And uh, so you always recover something. The only question is, mm -hmm. yeah. Right yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So you always get something back, right? You yeah. don't know if it's the solution. Yeah. Yeah. The, the expectation is that at least it's statistically consistent with what you expect. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, I mean, back, coming back to your question of mass conservation, I think it would be interesting to add some constraints um, into it. I mean, I, I think we, we probably cons kind of conserve mass because otherwise power spectra would be screwed up. Right, um, but it's not something that we impose. Um, right? Well, I, I guess the Lovitch um, displacement is kind of conserved. Yeah, I guess the Lovitch displacement conserve mass, right? So, so maybe, yeah. So maybe, maybe actually we do impose it. Yeah, right. yeah. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you uh, run through the loop again, is everything like really stable? 
Oh, you mean do the whole process again? Um. Ah, we haven't tried it, um, but yeah, that, that's a good, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Well, so there are a sequence of uh, movements of the uh, particles, and uh, they have eight, I think it's eight movement scales. And so each time you've got uh, this movement of particles to the supposedly broad cluster of providing positions, uh, but you still have the fine ring uh, polarity and stuff. So then at the end of the cycle of A, you've got what's supposed to be the issue to find. And, uh, uh, the question is if you apply exactly the same procedure to that. If everything remained absolutely stable, would you have to recompute your plastic on these uh, 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 solid gravity potential to reduce gravity? So, so I guess what you're asking is like as the input to our reconstruction, we should use a reconstructed density, right? Well, just to, just yeah. to check that yeah, yeah. effectively, yeah. we've got one pass, yeah. and the question is, is one pass converging? Right. Yeah. Yeah, we, we should. Yeah, we should definitely try that. Yeah. yeah. All right. If uh, there are no further questions, let's end.